Saints all proclaim one gospel of our Lord. And this is the period in which all Orthodox Christian people, and I'm speaking those of the five Oriental Orthodox churches, and even now it's fallen in the same period as the Greek and the Russian Orthodox to celebrate Easter as we are celebrating it now. It really spells out the fact that what happened 2,000 years ago didn't happen by chance. And that the Son of God came into our world, in our lives. All these churches and all Christian people cannot be wrong in proclaiming that the Son of God came into this world. If we're asking St. Mary, the Mother of God, to save all Christian people from the destruction of her son, and to remember all Orthodox we departed soul from the destruction of her son, what are we saying? It means that all Christian people who keep the commandment of our Lord, the honoring of the saints, the intercession of Our Lady St. Mary, Waladita Hamlak, based on a chance to enter into the paradise of the saints. And it means also that the Christians throughout the world were not orthodox. We have to beg mercy for them also, as they are begging mercy for us also in their own particular way, in their own practicing of their religious life. But we know for a fact the scripture cannot lie, and that Jesus Christus, our Lord, our God and our Savior, came into this world for one specific reason. He didn't come as a mighty king. He didn't come as a warrior. He didn't come in glorious apparel to sit on throne. He came in the most humble way, not perceived by man, as St. John said. In St. John's Gospel, the saint who rests his head on the shoulder of Jesus, the very saint who gave refuge and kept our lady Mariam until she was the age of 64. The same saints who in, was put on the highland of Patmos received this revelation. He wrote that the light came into the world. And men liked darkness rather than light because they, their deeds were evil. So they didn't want to come before the light so that the light can expose their, de their deeds. The saint wrote these things. Which light were you talking about? So we understand that this light, which was from the beginning, and when we say beginning, what are we saying? Because there is no beginning with God. There is no ending with him as is in Alpha and Omega in the chapter, last chapter of Revelation. I am the Alpha and Omega. So if we're saying in the beginning, we're saying in the beginning of human history, the beginning of our time, the beginning of the creation of this world. And it is this light that came into this world and he gave us history as a limitation of our humanity. And he himself also limited himself by our humanity by taking on the flesh of the Adam by becoming man. The prophecies of the saints cannot be wrong. And that's why I think this whole world that we live in him, we have to give an account. Every word spoken in error, every deed done, we have to give an account. But look at the world today. Can't you see the world is falling apart? Can the rulers lead themselves? How many governments has passed? And how many chaos and anarchy and confusion has been established by government? Remember the prophecies of Daniel. You know, we read this today. The prophecies of the early fathers. They who prophesied concerning the coming of the Messiah. 
the world doesn't want to know about Jesus Christ. And before Jesus Christ, before the coming of the Lord, people used to worship all forms of idolatrous gods, which could never save. And when you look at the gods in Egypt, Mesopotamia, all these, these gods which come down through those cha chain, chain in India, <laughs> they're still practicing today. The Dalai Lama, Krishna, Mazagoshi, all these fake gods, deities that can't bring those, they're still from time immemorial they're practicing these gods. No worship. The only true God his father spoke about. And they were blessed by the Holy Spirit. From the prophets, Yeshua, Ruth, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Job, Amos, Hosea, Zechariah, all these spoke about the word. Which word? The word, the Son of God. We know when we look in this world, we can never find salvation, we can never find any peace. So we are blessed today that we are gathered here in this church, Sarazia, St. Mary of Zion. Because here is the place of Golgotha. Here is the place where you will witness, you'll take your mind back to a thousand years ago and we'll reenact what happened then. And the word which was spoken by the prophets, which was read by you, the readers, materialized themselves spiritually. And we're able to see with uncanny accuracy the description of how our Lord was crucified. Some Christian people in the Orthodox Church, when it comes to Passion Week, Suffering Week, they reenact, not only reenact, they become part of that mystery of the crucifixion by visualizing how our Lord was crucified for us, the suffering that he went through. The world doesn't want to know this because they don't believe in the prophecy of Isaiah. Because Isaiah spoke in his third chapter, he spoke about a man. A man given, stricken. A man of despair. A man of anxiety. A man of frustration. He had no comeliness that we may like him. The world doesn't want to know about this kind of teaching. And so this mystery is hid from them. The mystery of the Orthodox faith is unique in the belief that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And why is he not the Son of God? We know that he is the Son of God. For the world, he is not the Son of God. Because they can claim there are many messiahs who came in the time of our Lord. But remember what the teaching says, what our Father says, there were many, no man, even the blind man said, which he healed, and we'll go through that in a minute. He said, I've never seen anything like this. No one in the world, as St. John in the description, is homily, he says, this man has done what no other man has done before. And in St. John, the very same gospel, he says, if we were to record every deed and action which the Son of God did, the whole world would not be able to contain it. So, coming back to this mystery, it's a blessing for Orthodox Christian to visualize the passion of the suffering of our Lord. And what occurred during the four readings is like we go to the four corners of the world. We hold back the four winds and we give an account of every quarter of the world. What occurred in the time of the leading up to the crucifixion. You have all fasted to the point now. And now you're elevating your soul by gaining spiritual knowledge. The knowledge that is not your, that is not human knowledge. You are about to perceive knowledge which comes from God. If we depend on our own vain knowledge, we will always believe what the politicians tell us. And some of us, because we are adherent to the politicians and the government of this world, we cannot exclude ourselves or excuse ourselves from not being here. But those who are calm, or go to the church on the day of the passion of our Lord, they are blessed because they are the one with the lamp. They, have, they, they are able to light their lamp and to see. And therefore they know before the suffering that the presentation building up to Easter, I should ask my employer to give me time off so that I can come and worship my God.
In the days of old, when the children of Israel was in Egypt, they did ask Pharaoh for one day to come and worship God. And in the end, Pharaoh had to give them. But in some cases, in Pharaoh's case, he took ten plague, and the last plague, the death of all his firstborn. They let them go. I don't want them before we kill all our people. So even if you said to your employer, today is our day. Um, this week, I work for you all my, um, these months now. Give me time off so I can come and worship my God. I am sure he will do this. But coming back to this day, as I said to you, all Orthodox Christians will rejoice today. Because it's not the suffering only we are rejoicing at. We are rejoicing because we visualize our salvation coming through the suffering of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Let's go into it now. Our Lord Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem, as you know. And he wasn't schooled in ordinary school like we. That's why when he was in the temple, they said to him, how come this child knows so much? He's never been to any school, yet he knows his knowledge is vast. In his early childhood, our Lord knew all his disciples. And even when he was playing amongst all the children, the miracles which he did sometimes fascinate the parents. And they used to say in those times, Yeshua is working hope, he's working miracles, he's doing something. Take your children away from him, hide them. But he, Yeshua, or Jesus, Yeshua in Hebrew, he humbly called the family. And what they used to do, the children used to do, they used to like, you know you have your children. And um, they would form like, a big circle and the children would run around and like you say ring a ring of roses a pocket full of so and so in the middle and he used to run around and said hail the king hail the king and he used to call all the people passing by come and hail the king so at early childhood he was recognized by his royalty and in early childhood he did many great miracles which are not accounted in the gospel and that's why we really respect the word in the homilies of saint john when he spoke to tiberius who at that time was the emperor of Rome, having succeeded Augustus. So this time now, we know that the early child of God tells us who Yeshua, Jesus was, how he came into the world. And we know the prophecies concerning him, as our father mentioned earlier, the reason why he came into this world. Because this world is passing away, says St. John, in chapter 2, verse 15, and the lust of it is passing. So if this world is passing away, then we know that this human nature which we have will one day pass away also. But we are in preparation for that. We are certain that it will happen. We know it will happen and it's going to happen. But there are stages before that happen. One of these stages is our worship, how we see God. How we repent, how we accept the teaching of Christianity. Because Christianity is the only means of salvation. There is no other means. You might ask the question, what about those souls who believe, who live a good life? and those who are happy in God and they live and they do humanitarian work. Good and well, they will get their reward. But we go by the word of God. What he said to Nicodemus when he was in this world. Unless a person born again will never enter the kingdom of God. So Jesus Christ, in his early childhood, he knows all the disciples. And when he met them, so you can say that when after he left, when, when Herod decided to slew the 2,000 children, and Joseph in a dream was warned, and he took the child from Jerusalem to Egypt. And he fled to Egypt. From Egypt, he went to Ethiopia. And he went to Lake Tana. So this recorded history is not even written in the scripture. But we know the teaching of our Father tells us and reminds us. So when we cross examine, when we compare and we contrast, we begin to see a clearer picture of the life of Christ. So when he began his ministry, his ministry was his later life. It wasn't just three years. Thirty years of his life can and must be accounted for. And it's only because we, we read from the King's James Version of his 66 books, we do not look at the apocalyptic works of the other Deuteronical books, canonical books, which are not included in the 66 books of King St. James. And therefore, that lack of knowledge is not in this Bible. So when we talk about the teaching of our fathers, we seem to base our teaching only on the 66 books of King James. This is not the case. That is why Orthodox Christianity remains Orthodox unadulterated. What about the oral teaching of our fathers? Most of these teachings, which is oral teaching, had never been written. It's by word of mouth, by tradition, by custom, by language. 
So the wealth of our Lord's teaching through his disciples, through his prophets, all came down to us. This is because of the love of God. He prepared the foundation. He created everything. He prepared the foundation before he makes his final entry. God was angry with our world when he, the world when he created it. And that's why the deluge came. And that's why Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. And now today, God is still angry. And if anyone says to you, peace, 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 there is no peace. God is still angry with this world because of the sin of mankind. When you read about homosexuality, lesbianism, gayism, and all these other isms and schism in the world, why should our Lord be angry? And when you compromise your faith and you accept this kind of behavior, why should our Lord be angry? In this teaching, in this time, unless you speak the truth, unless you uncompromise and speak the truth to our, about our Lord, you will not be saved. A man must take up his cross in St. John chapter 17 and follow me. He that does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. So, the anger of our Lord. Remember what he said to Isaiah. Who will believe our report? To whom the word of the Lord went? To whom the word of the Lord went? And Zechariah spoke about him in chapter 9. When he in Zechariah spoke about him going into Jerusalem and saying to Adam and Eve, the two donkeys, untie the two donkeys and bring them to me. And yet, thousands of years ago, Zechariah spoke about the Messiah coming, a man, a man of humility, riding on the back of a donkey, the fall of a horse. The smallest did not know that Adam and Eve was the reasons why he came, and that when he went into Jerusalem to untie the two donkeys, he was untying the sins of Adam and Eve, the two donkeys, and he only rode in one of them. And at the same time, when he was riding on the back of the donkey, tell me something, if our Lord had come riding into Jerusalem on the back of a lion, what would you think? You'd run away. If he was riding on the back of a cow or the back of a bull, what would you, you'd run away. And yet still, the lion was riding on the back of the donkey. The lion of the tribe of Judah. The lawgiver. He was riding on the back of the donkey coming into Jerusalem. And in reverse order, the lion was riding on the back of the donkey. But yet, if they see the appearance of a lion, they would run away. Jesus Christ, he spoke in parables, in similes, because he knew the minds of the scribes and the Pharisees hypocrite. He knew that they breathed out fire, their cunningness, their craftiness. He knew all about them. And that's why hundreds of years ago, he spoke to the prophets telling them concerning his Messiah, his Messiahship, his journey from heaven to earth. And Isaiah spoke about him. In fact, Jacob spoke about him. And we're going to read something, one of the fathers. So you know it is not, when we speak about the fathers, we're not speaking about our word or to glorify ourselves. We speak as the Holy Spirit give us permission to speak concerning God. And I'm going to read for you one of the mysteries concerning our Lord Jesus Christ coming into this world. We know from what our Father said earlier today that the promise fulfilled by our Lord that he made to Adam and Eve has come through 2,000 years ago. But on reflection of that, all the fathers spoke concerning the prophecies of the Messiah coming into the world. Genesis chapter 49 and uh, verses from verses 9. From being a shoot, my son, you have grown up. He bowed down, he slept as a lion and as a cub. And who shall arouse him? The scepter shall not part from Judah, nor the lawgiver from his loins, until Shiloh come. And unto him be the expectation of the nation, binding his colt to the vine, and his donkey, the colt, to his branch. Look at that. Hundreds of years ago, the prophet spoke about the Messiah coming into Jerusalem. And then Zacharias, the prophet of Zacharias, echoed what Jacob said. Tell the daughters of Zion, behold your king cometh riding upon a colt, the fault of an ass. Zacharias chapter 9. How did Zacharias know this? That the king would come riding into Jerusalem. The king of who? And yet still, the very king who stood before Pilate, are you a king, Pilate said, they tell the daughters of, of, of Zion, your, your king come riding upon the fall of a donkey. Don't quarter. 
There was many don't quarter in that time, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrite. They didn't understand the mystery, even of the humbleness of the donkey. In fact, the donkey was more humble than the scribes and the Pharisees, hypocrite. And today, the donkey is more humble than the politician of today. The donkey has more sense than the politicians of the day. Because the politicians of the day, the only business they know is Ginza, money. Yet the donkey would knew how to carry the back of his Messiah. So who's going to get the whip in the last days? Not the donkey, but the donkey that's out there. When our Lord Jesus Christ came into this world, he came so that the Adam and Eve should be saved. He didn't come as a great warrior. And the prophets spoke about him in this way. Now, when you look again, the miracles, if you look at his CV, which he did from the beginning, if you were to look at the CV for a man who didn't, wasn't educated in any particular school, if you look at his, his CV, first reading of his CV, and the prophet in those days, to be a prophet, you have to articulate the word of God to precision without making a mistake, otherwise you'll be stoned. Any of the prophets speaking about God, the words was accurate. And then he went, the prophets went and they preached to the people. Behold, Noah in the time, and Jonah. Noah was building his ark. Noah was a prophet. He was prophesying to the people, change your behavior. When Abraham met our Lord in the Kudus Selassie, he said, Lord, will you at this time go? He said, where are you going? I'm going to Sodom and Gomorrah. Why? To see about the sins of the people as the sins it is today. In fact, Sodom and Gomorrah will fare better in the judgment that is coming for this time. Because now you see the homosexuals walking around in the street. And in France, Paris, and all over the place. They said the time hasn't changed now. And in that time, during the time of Abraham, Abraham said, will you destroy the righteous with the sinners? And at that time, our Lord Jesus Christ says, oh, Abraham was found favor with God. For adventure, I will not destroy the city. He said, my cousin Lot is there, I know, says our Lord. But yet I go to visit that place because the sins cry to me. And Abraham said to him, plead to him, Lord, what if you find 50 people in the city? 50 righteous souls. For adventure, Lord, will you destroy the whole of the, 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 the country and the 50 people as well. Merciful God is merciful. He said to Abra Abraham, I will not destroy the city for the 50 people's sake. 50 people and, and even if, you, if our Lord came and he find 50 people all the whole world, you know what he will do? <laughs> he will still destroy the world but he will save the 50 people because it is written, this world will pass away. But at the time of Sodom and Gomorrah, the dialogue was for Abraham to understand the mystery of God. And think of it, Abraham was a man like you and I, and he was able to speak with God. So that person must have found favor. He must have reached a state of purity that he could actually verbally speak to God. Nowadays, many of us, the only way we can speak to God is through prayer. Because we have such sinful lips. We hide so many things in our hearts. We store so much things that we need to take out all these things out of our hearts and put in what's necessary for salvation. So when Abraham said to him, my Lord, peradventure, even if you find 45 people in that city, will you save the city for 45 people's sake? Indeed, Abraham, I will save the city for 45 people's sake. And he came down to 10 people, and believe it or not, Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed because there was not one person in there apart from Lot and his two daughters, even his wife. The perfume and the dancing and the frivolity changed her mind and she went straight back in Sodom and boom, the world blew up and died. So what's going to happen in this time? Isaiah spoke about the world being set alight on fire. Jeremiah and Ezekiel, that it will burn up. We know that Russia and America, we know that China, we know Paris and Fr France, we know all these countries are storing nuclear arms. And where are they storing it for? They're storing all these weapons. Do you think these weapons are going to just sit down cushionly and comfortably? And they says the harms race. They're going to try and make those big countries get rid of their harms. 
And at the same time, they're stockpiling germ warfare, trying to wipe out the human race so that you have a, a race of people who are rich and everything else. And so they push all the poor people out of the city and they dominate the city. Now, the children of Jafat are now ruling until Shiloh come. And you see what's going to happen. So they will think when they see our Lord coming, they will say UFO, they will say spaceship, and then America and Russia, they launch everything and they make up for a war. But what happened now? Boom! Shock and horror, like Bush would say, but only a different nature. This time, the whole thing will explode. And they will understand the mystery of God that he come to save his people. That's why he said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom was of this world, I would call on my age. Then they would say, well, look, a UFO. And then they see the sun, the sky, the sky roll over. And they see mirrors of beings in white. Some with sheets, some lightning sword. They all, everything, every valley flee from its place. Prophecy of, of Ezekiel. The prophecy, Ezekiel says, and I saw dry bone in the valley. Waiting to be resurrected. Waiting for the birth of God to come so that rise my children in the resurrection. The mystery of the scripture is there. Unhurt it. Decode it. Know about yourself. And let me say this to you. When you look at the scripture, most of our people believe that the scripture only speaks about one particular race of people. And there's no part in the scripture that speaks about me. And I say me because me is me. And we are all in this scripture here, not only me but you. We're all in the scripture. All of us are called. And that's why Jesus Christ came. He came to save you. He came to save you over there. He came to save you. But he's not going to save you until he fills you with the Holy Spirit. And today we are asking God to come down and bless us. Give us the grace of the Holy Spirit and heal us. Now, Isaiah spoke about this happening. Amos also says concerning the generation of the people, who these people are, and why we should continue in this time until the second coming of our Lord. My brothers and sisters in Christ, our Lord entered into Jerusalem, and on Hosanna you heard what happened. The children of the people were shouting Hosanna, speaking about the prophet Zacharias. This is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the eyes. And the name Hosanna means God, glory to God in heaven. So they're giving praise to God who's riding on the back of the donkey. But at the same time, a few days after that, see what happened with the minds of the people now. Few days after that, the same mouth which gave glory was able to be twisted and turned into crucify him. Crucify him. Now you see, our Lord Jesus Christ, you know and I know, he had the power to do many things. He could have destroyed them when he wanted to. Like our father rightly said earlier, just by the click of an hand. He could easily dismiss them, but he didn't do it. Even when they arrested him in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know what the Jews said? The Jews said that we have a, a teaching that, all right, when Pilate brought Jesus, they said we can beat him 37 times and let him go. That is our teaching. But you know, you forget one thing. When they started to beat him, when they arrested him in the Garden of Gethsemane, the beating started then. They kicked him, they punched him, they threw him down on the ground, they spat in his face, they did everything. And no record of that in the scripture. The suffering. You tell me now. By the time they finished beating, and our father meant already tell you the, the, the weapons that they used to beat him, it flayed the skin. So by the time he was fasting, a man of hunger, a man fasting, as I said. So he's fasting, he's praying, he's completely dehydrated, and you're giving him all these beatings. How do you think? You think sometimes when he's quiet, he wants to say, he wants to say, he has no voice sometimes. Because if you believe that he suffered perfectly, 
then you have to believe when they when you when they put the first lash over him and he's fasting, he's fell down, he's fell down before they even brought him before the Praetorium, brought him before Caiaphas and Ananias. He already busted up, his rib already broken. They already punched him till was, his eyes were all swollen. So the, the, big, the beating started from the Garden of Gethsemane. From Judas go, mm, kiss him. He said, you betray your master with a kiss, Judas. They grabbed him, they hold him, and they started beat, kicking, spitting, do everything to him. And by the time he reached the place where the scribe fire, he was already beaten and broken up. But yet still not one of his bones, he was bruised. That's what Isaiah said, he was bruised for our sins. They start bruising him from the Garden of Gethsemane until they reach there. So when the Jews said, oh, we have a system that we, we just beat him and we le release uh, one, the, you have to understand the mystery. And look at it today. The Jews that are in Palestine today, do you think it's the same Jew that would have got the same beating 2,000 years ago? Open your eyes, for goodness sake. Who am I talking about? Yeshua, Hebrew. Open your eyes. The same Jew that got beaten, bruised, and they presented him before Pilate. Caiaphas and Ananias, the priests of the day, they presented him there. He didn't do anything, he said anything. He just humbly, he only measured his word and he spoke according to what the prophets had spoken about him. Notice when our Lord speak, he only, as he opened his mouth, it is a quotation from some of the prophets. So you know his word is accurate and the prophecies of the prophecies is accurate to a T. So, in the book, Jeremiah, Jeremiah, Jeremiah was just but a young man when lords called him. His prophecy concerning the people of Israel, how and what they would do with the Messiah. Jeremiah said to our Lord, Lord, I'm only a, a young man, 19 year old, why do you call me? Don't say you're young, said our Lord. Jeremiah, go and speak to the people and tell them, change their ways. The priests, the deacons, the clergy, and everyone today, we are doing the same from the Leviticus priest order, telling the people to change their ways. Come to the priest and receive your penance, your nitzaha, advice. Come. Jeremiah was telling them. So in the days of old, the priest then would have been like Jeremiah. Nothing has changed according to the Levitical priesthood. Now, Jeremiah spoke concerning the Messiah. And you have to understand also that Jonah spoke in the same way concerning God. And we know also that Zacharias in the last chapter, all these prophets can never be wrong. All these prophets spoke as the Holy Spirit gave them permission to speak. And today, we are witness to these words of the Holy Prophets. Now, when our Lord Jesus Christ came, as I said to you before, his CV, and I'm going to tell you CV briefly, he took five loaves of fishes and two, two fishes, five loaves. When the disciples said to him, and the people was following him, and they said to him, um, I've been working on the miracles. The CV was that, Lord, all the people gathered and decided, how shall we feed them? And he said, um, are there any food here? He said, well, there's dabo and uh, asa. Uh, there's bread and fish. Um, there's, a, there's a boy there with a basket and five loaves and two fish. No, nothing spoke about the little boy who had the five loaves. The Bible don't even give an account of the little boy with his five loaves and two fish. Where did he get the fish from and the five loaves? How did he know to bring the two fish there? That is prophetic. So our disciples, Peter, come to him and said, Lord, look, there's five loaves. Look, 500 people here, and he divided them into, see the mystery now, he divided them into order. 500. He divided them. Now, the same way in which, when he said to them, take the six jar of water, and the wine is finished, a hadu, the wine changed into water. Same way he gets to the bread, the double. And he blessed it, his CV. Give it to the people. So by the time they take up the basket and they pass the fish, as they take up one bread, another bread appear. As they take up another fish, a fish appear. And the miracles, the basket become full. They have to get all 12 baskets. Imagine, there was only one basket, and yet 12 other baskets is found. 
filled to the brim and he gave it to the people that's another miracle but see the greediness of it now the people because they were hungry at the time and they were being taxed by uh, Tiberius and Augustus they were hungry and obviously this person was giving free food and would you not follow him if he was giving free food even if he didn't want to eat him if I was hungry I'd follow him for free food but they were doing the same thing that we would have done the same way I want dumpling from him I want fish dumpling and fish I want it Dabo and Asa I need it let's follow him and hear his word so they literally they were doing the same thing which we would have done and he himself realized and said to them some of you you don't really follow me for my word. You follow me because you're hungry. I know that. So the human nature is typical. That's one of his CV. The other one is, when he was going into the temple, the blind man, now our father mentioned it earlier before, but the mystery of the blindness was, when you see a blind man in Ethiopia, sometimes the blind man don't have any socket in his eye. Have you ever seen a blind man? You, today's blind man, you, they have the blinds and have, and you can read grill. But this blind man couldn't read any grill. There's no grill in that time. So, what oh, when our Lord saw him there, right? He said to him, He couldn't, he said, I am the light of the world. He's quoting from Jen. He said, My Lord, I am the light of the world. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world, he said. And so, he take this spittle. You have read it in the scripture. See the mystery. He took the clay and he wrapped it. Mud. <laughs> Spit on it. And he put it inside. We know socket was. He put it in the highway, there's no sock it was. And he said, go and wash in the pool. If you wash anything with water, the mud is going to come out. But yet the mud was stuck in the, in the socket there. And when he washed it, the highs come back. The man was sick. So remember when he was a childhood, as a, as, a, as a child, he used to make mud clay, birds, and he used to throw it up like that, and it appeared they fly. So why couldn't he do the same thing now when he was a grown-up? In a mysterious way, he did the same thing. He gave new sight. This is his miracle. Now you heard what our father said. The amount of miracle which he did. Now the other, the other miracles which fascinated the Jews was when, they, when he was in the temple, having overturned the money changes, everything else, and they stood there, people coming around him. And they said, well, are you the Christ then? Why would give you the authority to do these things, the things you're doing? Why are you doing these things? And he said to them, having spoken about the Messiah, he said, if I testify of myself, my testimony is not, is nothing. But he who sent me, test I testify of him. Because he knew what was in the hearts of men and he didn't want any glory. So he was saying to them, he's testifying of the Father. And then when he finished, he hold up his hand like that and he said, I and my father are one. He said, what? And they take a big rock stone and run him down to throw and hit him. Because at that time, at that time, he was making himself like God. I and my father are one. Where did you hear that prophecy? You heard the prophecy in St. John chapter 14. When Philip, the same Philip who went to the Ethiopian eunuch and baptized him, he said to Philip, Philip, show us the father. He said, Philip, I've been with you so long. And you're asking me to show you the father. Did not our father said earlier on, when you call him by name, he's Prince of Peace, he's the everlasting Father. So, so from the beginning, the description, the appellation was giving you who he was. So by right, when he said to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the, uh, Sadducees I and my Father are one, he was not lying, he was telling them the truth. And so I said to them, I tell you the truth. I and my Father are one. So, and then, just like that, they wanted to stone him. When he run in the temple, when they look for him, they can't find him. They disappear from them. Because he can do that. His time was not nine. Remember many times. So you can see how the CV built up. The final CV was the resurrection of Lazarus. You knew Lazarus was in the grave four days, our father said. Why four days? Why do you think Lazarus is in the four days? And why is it Mary and Martha, the two sisters, when they came to our Lord and said, By no Lord he stinks. So the body should, by, by right, start to decay. What is earth must go back to the earth. So Lazarus, his miracle of our Lord, his body was about to decay. But at that time, when our Lord knew that he died, what did he say to them? He said, to the disciples said to him, Lord, if you go now, the body is stink. He said, 
But first he said to them, I go to wake Lazarus. He said, then he said, oh, if Lazarus is sleeping, then there's no need to wake him. He wake him naturally. Lazarus, then Allah said, no, Lazarus is dead. Where in history have you ever heard anyone bringing back anyone from the dead? You may have heard it in Elijah, but Elijah didn't do it the same way as our Lord did. When Lazarus already appointed a stink, when the body would have been decayed, Lazarus said, I hear a voice when he was in hate. A terrible voice called me. Hate, he said, he rent him from my arm. I couldn't hold on to Lazarus. When he says, Lazarus, come forth, the thunder of his voice enters straight down into the hate and rip away Lazarus from the arm of Satan. That's the power of Christ. That is the lion I'm talking to you about who rode in Jerusalem. When he roared, Hades had to let go the soul of Lazarus. Think then what will happen in the coming of our Lord. When he roared, you think those military might and their um, skylight plane and their uh, firefox and then all these phantom jets, do you think that can prevent what's going to happen? So when the lion roared, the lion is on our side, thank goodness. And we don't have to worry too much about that. So Lazarus gave, came back from the dead. That was the miracles of our Lord. A great miracle. And it spells out at the same time our resurrection. St. Matthew chapter 27. At noon, they made Jesus. They made Jesus to robe himself. And they took him to be crucified. Now, he's, picture this in your mind. He's beaten, he's exhausted. And he can hardly stand on his feet. He was fasting 40 days. And it was even before the banquet, when he broke bread with them and he told them, he said, you know, um, he spoke to his mother and he said to his mother, Mom, you know the Jews are going to crucify me. And do not worry, Mom, because I will, I will make all things new. Don't worry when you see me between the two thieves. So the breaking of the bread, when he broke bread with them, having washed their feet, and he broke bread with them, and he said to them, Henceforth I shall not drink of the vine of this fruit until I drink it anew with you in the Father's kingdom. He knew that they was about to break him. And so he broke bread and he gave it to his disciples. So when they, the fasting left from there, the God gave him their rest, and now they beat him and they give him to the, take his robe. You can understand why Isaiah wrote in such uncanny accuracy the description of the suffering Christ. It is true. It is not a lie, it's not fiction, it is true. And they made him robe himself. And you know the kind of robe that people wear? You know the purple robe? Purple robe is a symbol of royalty. And they make him to robe himself in a purple robe. And then they start mock him. Now remember what the scripture says, I said to you before. And remember I spoke to you in a metaphorical way, that the incoming riding upon the back of a donkey, and the bulls, what you have to understand is, is that those centurions, even though our father mentioned to you that they were mindless morons and that they, the only ultimate thing they wanted to do was they take pleasure inflicting pain. And so they were like the bulls, the bulls of Bashan, says the scripture. And they tore at his garment. So they were laughing eagerly. They were waiting to gouge his flesh. They were waiting to do the most terrible thing to him. So then he robed himself, says St. Matthew. And they took him to be crucified. Now, we reached a point at that time at noon. At noon time, our Lord Jesus Christ was coronated upon the cross. Think of it, midday. How can, how can the day change midday? We talk about three days and three nights in the belly of the in the belly of the hurt, and Jonah being three days in the belly of the whale. You see now, you're gonna see the zodiac, or the, 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 the western side is called the zodiac, you can see the eclipse now. Some, at that time when, when darkness came over the earth, the scribes and Pharisees said, oh we know that because the stargazers then, when the eclipse of the sun, and then it closes for a time. But it, for three hours, darkness, so that 
darkness represented one day also. And then the day. But before this, why do we use the term, or what the meaning of the term Golgotha or Calvary? Calvary is the place, or Golgotha is the place, the center of the earth. The center where Adam's grave is. They crucify him, the center of the earth, Adam's grave. How did they know it was the center? Because geometrically, these people are very clever. And they know by measuring times, that's why the Lord said you can measure time, you know when it's going to rain, you know when the sun is shining, so they know according to signs and so on. They know that they can measure the eclipse, they can know when the eclipse is going to come. So they were doing that hundreds of years ago, even the Mayans they were doing that. So this knowledge came down. So they tried to associate this miracle. The sky at 12 noon, darkness upon the whole land, as a scientific explanation to something that is very spiritually profound. Yeah. So we understand. Our Lord Jesus Christ, at that time, darkness was upon the whole land. And at the second coming of our Lord, the same darkness will be upon this world. Darkness will be at the second coming of our Lord. So at that, so the symbol of the of the twelve noon midday becoming dark evening like night is no mystery in the sense that it cannot be understood. It is a miracle. It's not a mystery. It's a miracle because heavens was not in agreement with the decision what mankind did. When the angels saw what happened, they were not in decision with what humanity had done to the creator of heaven and earth. And so, this was another sign. The Jews and the scribes and the Pharisees, hypocrite, they, at that time, they didn't believe until they see that sign. So, when he was crucified between the two thieves, Something else happened. The thief that was on his right hand and the thief was on his left hand. These same two thieves takes us back to the time of our Lord early childhood when he was in Egypt. Demas and Titus. Now Titus was more the compassionate thief. And you can understand Mariam. When Mariam was going through Egypt, she, they, they went, came to a, a group of robbers and there was Demas and Titus, two young men at the time. And they were in a group of robbers. And then, Demas wanted to steal all the clothing that our Lord had. And uh, Titus said to him, no, let, let them go, they're royal family. Listen, I will give you my girdle, just let them go. But you know, if Titus had not done that, then something else may have happened. But then, Mariam was very pleased with Titus because she see that he was very compassionate. And then our Lord spoke to Mariam and said to him, you know, mom, as a child, can you imagine that? As a child, he's speaking to his mom and he's telling his mom, you know, mommy, these, these two thieves that you see here, one of them will be on my left-hand side and one will be on my right-hand side at my coronation, which was to happen 30 years next, um, later on. So you can understand then, Demos and Titus, were literally part of the equation of the fulfillment of that at your right hand. And that's so it was said. The prophecy concerning Simon of Cyrene, who carried the cross of our Lord. Yes, we, we are almost out of time now. So, Simon of Cyrene carried the cross of our Lord. We have to carry our cross. Not carry our sins, carry our cross. We carry our sins to the cross to be nailed. And it's the very reasons why our Lord came, to take our sins away and to nail it on the cross. And they crucify Jesus between two thieves. Today, there are many thieves in the world, sometimes come into your house unannounced. And you have to be vigilant. But the kind of thief our Lord is talking about is the repentant one, the sinner. So today, many sinners are becoming, who were, were once thieves, have now become Christians and have baptized and accepted Christ. So even our own lifestyle, we were once 
along the line of thieves because we disobeyed the commandment of God and we're doing contrary until the, the word of God came to us. So may the blessing of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.